obligatory you know, presentation startup exercises. Raise of hands. How many of you call yourselves? Well done. <laughs> Just raise his hand. Uh, <laughs> uh, how many of you call yourselves Drupal site builders? Okay, cool. How many of you call yourselves content strategists? Wow. Um, so this talk is, is mostly for the site builders. If you're a Drupal site builder, you'll hopefully learn a bit more about content strategy and how content strategists think. If you're a content strategist, hopefully you'll learn a bit more about how Drupal site builders think and you know, how you can talk to them and explain what you need. I am actually neither, <laughs> which is, might be a problem. You'll let me know. Um, what I do is, um, as I said, I'm a CTO of BlueSpark, and BlueSpark does um, kind of uh, sites uh, for large organizations, you know, multiple um, um, stakeholders, uh, universities. And we're also a bit weird because we spend a lot of time, we don't just do consulting for other people, we spend a lot of time um, building our own products. So uh, one of them is Roomify. If you're into travel, bookings, you need to check this out. And the other one is Italy. And Italy is um, an online digital brand. Uh, I live in Italy, so it kind of works out. Um, and uh, I'm going to be using Italy as the example in a lot of the uh, things I'm going to be talking about. Okay, so the first thing is Defining content strategy. And there is, if you look it up online, there is all sorts of different definitions. The way I like to think of it is content strategy is adapting your content to the context. Right? And I have an elaborate example to illustrate this. So the example is Austin. Right? So we're in Austin, and Blue Spark comes along to Austin. That's Blue Spark. Or there you go. That's Blue Spark. And you know, we want to say we're Blue Spark in Austin, though. It's a different context. So take that away. Change our I'm trying to figure out how this works. Hold on. That's a bit better, right? That is Blue Spark in Austin, adapting your content to your strategy. But I'm, I'm just going to take a break here because there was a huge, much better intro to this. And my, my remote thing didn't make it work. So you're going to bear with me because this is important. That's Blue Spark. You see the effect. That's Blue Spark in Austin. Okay, thank you. No more effects, I promise. It's all going to be serious now. Not really. Okay, so content strategy has been becoming increasingly more important for people. You know, it's been growing and you hear more and more about it and people calling themselves content strategists and so on. And one of the main reasons is this. Right? Smartphones. Smartphones have um, been the thing that made the need for content strategy very evident because you could literally see your content in a completely different context and it was very obvious that very often it doesn't adapt to that context. Uh, but content strategy isn't just about, you know, smartphones. And how many of you have heard mobile first? Right. Everyone likes mobile first. I have an issue with mobile first. Um, um, I think it's, you know, sure, mobile first, but a few years from now, it's going to, what is it going to be? Glass first, you know, adapted to your glass. Is it going to be self-drive car first? Really what it is is content everywhere, right? You need your content to show up in whatever context it's going to be and do that properly. 
So mobile first is great. It's a great way of thinking about it, but it's not you know, the, the end all and be all of content strategy. This is a great definition of what content strategy can, can really be. Uh, the practice of understanding what content is needed to meet both users' needs and organizational goals, producing it and creating realistic publishing and governance plans to keep it that way. And that's a great book, uh, Content Everywhere. So if you're interested, check it out. Um, now, the problem with that is there is a lot going on. You know, in order to put all of that together, you have to work with information architects, user experience, there's content management, there's editorial management, there's site building, you have to tie all of this to business goals. So one of the challenges is that the content manager is kind of all the things. We, we love this in Blue Spark. It's like, this is one of our favorite. We need to do all the things. Um, so, you know, another way to think about what content strategy is, is think about what it does to your site, to your business. You know, what does success look like? Uh, what does it mean I've done it properly? And this is a, is a great list that I've kind of put together from a number of different sources. So the first thing, as we were talking about before, content is not bound to a page, right? It's flexible, it's future ready. We can provide the content the best chance it stands to satisfy what a user will need. Uh, finding, using, resharing is easy. The message and editorial vision are clear. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's complicated. You have to think about who you are and what do you want to say and how do you want to say it. Um, you actually have to help content creators you know, so that they can focus and enjoy the process and not fight with their CMS. And we need to know it works because we measured it as opposed to, you know, we, we think it works. And I'm going to be talking a bit more about that. So that's content strategy. What's Drupal site building? And, okay, this is the Drupal site building track. Uh, a lot of you are Drupal site builders, so I realize this may sound superfluous, but uh, there's a point to this. I actually went on Drupal.org. And Drupal.org says, Drupal site building is implementing business functionality and features into your Drupal site. Just that. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, thinking of the structure and creating the content types, vocabularies, uh, views, panels, menus you're going to need. And really, you know, what we end up doing is kind of figuring out of all this thousands of possibilities on Drupal.org in terms of modules, what is that ideal, magical set of modules that's going to build the perfect site for us? So what does Drupal look like with content strategy? As I said, I live in Italy. This is the Italian equivalent of Drupal. It's everywhere. It's everything to everyone, right? And, you know, people use it in lots of different ways. So that's Drupal with your content strategy. You kind of figure out how is it going to carry your content from point A to point B. And the choices you make are very important. It's going to influence, you know, what sort of content you can put into it. And, you know, like you can, I guess, try to go for a certain demographic. Or you can make choices you will regret. So, you know, we have to think this through. And this, is, this I think, is, is very important. And I know a lot of Drupal site builders are feeling me right now. You have all these other people, you know, your content strategists and your user experience experts and your information architects and your designers and the business people. And they talk and talk and they say, this is what we need, this is what we have to do. And it kind of shows up and it's, okay, 
build it. And the Drupal site builder is the person that's actually going to build this. That means taking any number of decisions that were never actually thought of. So the Drupal site builder is really uh, kind of an unrecognized architect. Maybe, maybe we should do that. Maybe we should you know, petition Drupal.org to take away the word site builder and replace it with architect because that's really what site builders are. They make all sorts of decisions about how all this stuff is going to be implemented and they have to do that in a way that's going to support the needs of today and you know, the needs going forward. Oh yeah. So, yeah. Content strategy and Drupal site building together can be quite intense, but it's a lot of fun, you know. I'll stop now. Okay, so what's the first thing a Drupal site builder, um, what's the first thing they, they need to do? It's modeling the world in Drupal. And, the, um, and I think this is, this is really the strength of Drupal, and this is the part that you know, Drupal site builders need to think a lot about what are their tools for modeling the world. This is what they're really doing, they're architects. Um, and this is what content strategists need to understand in order to speak to site builders. And the reason I'm here uh, kind of took, talking about Drupal is, uh, is because of the strength of its modeling tools. Um, so it was, I think, 2006, and I've been working on Italy, as I mentioned, the, the website, for about a year. It was a complete mess of um, 10 WordPress blogs. Don't ask me why, but it was 10 different WordPress blogs. There were two Joomla sites in there doing specific things. There was some custom script for property management and there was a vBulletin forum, all for one site. And the question was, you know, what do we do next? This is clearly unsustainable. We need to change it. And it kind of got down to Ruby on Rails. It was, it was cool at the time. Um, and Drupal. And Ruby on Rails, everyone was talking about. You know, if you wanted to be the hipster of 2005, you had to be doing Ruby on Rails. So it was, I just so much wanted to do Ruby on Rails. Um, but then you had Drupal, and Drupal was talking about nodes as this generic content type and fields that you attach to nodes and um, taxonomies and vocabularies. And in a previous life, uh, I was in academia and I was doing semantic web technologies. So I was saying, wow, this is awesome. These people are way ahead of the curve here. So we went with Drupal. And it's, that's, that's Drupal strength, modeling your uh, kind of domain in it. And it gives you all sorts of tools to do that. Now, as you're modeling things, you know, you, you, it's a continuous game of balancing abstraction, modularity. And when it's, uh, when it's done right, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, when it's done differently, it's, uh, it's still beautiful, but it's just not that useful. So, and I was talking about this with um, some of my colleagues this morning. There is, there is actually no mathematical proof. You know, I'm coming from academia, kind of did inference logics and constantly trying to tame the world and just write that perfect equation that proves um, what we wanted to do. And there, is, there isn't anything like that. There is no mathematical proof about what is the correct content type or the correct structure of a site. So what you end up doing is depending on uh, best practices, core principles. And I think what's very important in terms of kind of building that set of best practices is to focus on a specific set of tools and learn to use those tools very well. Because if you just keep changing your tool set, so change is healthy, 
But if you keep doing it all the time, you never have the time to actually develop a set of best practices. And then the other thing that's very important is build prototypes. Test them, break them, build them again. Usually when we're discussing, you know, how should we build a site in Drupal, um, in BlueSpark, we'll end up with two, maybe three competing approaches. And then someone's going to say, okay, I'm going to go away and build this and we'll see how it works. And that's another place where Drupal is great. It's a great prototyping tool. As you're building things, <laughs> please, please keep in mind who you're building it for. And, and, and this, is, this, is, this is kind of always a tricky point. Um, there is, how many of you use Develop Generate? There you go. I mean, it's, it's kind of the lorem ipsum of, of Drupal. And it's great, right? There's, there's, and actually, lorem ipsum can be great as well. But at some point, you have to step away from that and use the real content. Give it to the person that's actually going to be producing this stuff and let them play with it. And it's not necessarily that you're wrong in how you build the content type or whatever. It's just that they will never have thought of all the things they need before they actually got the chance to use it and build something with it. So Drupal, as I said, has a great set of tools for modeling the world. And I'm just going to quickly go through these things. In, in, uh, in Drupal 6, it was just node, it, nodes in Drupal 7, it's entities, right? And you really need to be thinking of your Drupal site as a set of entities with um, the associated uh, fields. And uh, then everything else builds on top of that. So you have uh, nodes, comments, files, users, and terms. These are really all just entities. And the, the quicker you start thinking of things like that, as opposed to just nodes, and nodes are one thing and they can have fields and the others don't, the, the faster you will be able to build more complex models of, uh, of your domain in Drupal. Because you have this stuff that comes out of uh, Drupal core, and then you have another set of entities, products, profiles, um, beans, which is really turning blocks into entities, um, and then you can actually build your own custom entities, right? And all this is your world. And the fact, and it's, it's a great balance between um, uh, abstraction uh, and, and, and modularity because you can think of everything just as entities and fields. And anything you do at the entity and field level applies to everything else. If you get into kind of some of the higher levels, um, one more effect, that's it. So once you get into custom data structures, that's, that begins to be a problem, right? Because the model of your world starts to break down. It's no longer just um, entities and fields. So be very wary of uh, kind of thinking uh, maybe directly in terms of um, MySQL tables and their structure and so on. Drupal is supposed to take care of that. And you have to think of the world the way Drupal views it so you don't fight Drupal, you work with it, right? Now, once you have your world thought of like this, you can start you know, breaking that down and making models of the world. And literally, you don't, you don't I mean, Drupal is a, is a great prototyping tool and you can um, go away and immediately do content types, but it's worth initially to just break things down and say, okay, wh what is it that I'm, I'm going to be doing here? So I'm going to be writing stories. Those stories might have a location. They might have a topic. There is an author. What is that author? Is it actually a Drupal user? Do I want that? Um, what fields am I going to have? Uh, if I have an image, is that just something that people upload and that's the end of that image? Or is it something that I need to take care of so it's another entity and it can have its own fields and its relationship to other things and it can be reused throughout the site. And then you can take advantage of all the tools that Drupal has to bring all this stuff together. 
right? So when you're thinking fields, you're thinking, well, what sort of fields? Uh, is it just a numeric field? Um, do I need to have a widget like uh, hierarchical select? Uh, is it just a drop down? Is it a text area? And it's all these decisions that are going to impact the behavior of your Drupal site. And it's all these things that define what the content strategists are then going to be able to do with that content. Right? These decisions impact how and where you can display your content. Um, so, you know, thinking of stuff like field collection so that you conceptually group things together and make them you know, a subpart of, uh, of another entity. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go through all these uh, modules and so on. I just put them up there and then I'll share the slides and uh, you probably know quite a few of them, maybe some you don't. One of the great things is you know, how many field uh, modules there are out there. Um, then you have you know, stuff like field group uh, where you can uh, decide how to group fields together in terms of the user interface. Field collection, which literally semantically kind of groups them together. And yeah, there's, there's all sorts of modules. And this is, um, this is the Drupal site builder's job, right? To know how many things there are out there that can help them develop a site, model their world. Then you have another tricky decision. How many um, use custom text formats for their sites? This is a very, a very powerful tool, and it's, you know, it's not that many, um, because you have this continuum between absolute freedom, you know, full HTML. Actually, you know, Drupal even lets you do PHP, but we, we don't talk about that. Um, so you, you can have absolute freedom. You can have you know, absolute austerity. It's like just text. That's it. Uh, or you can find some sort of balance between all of this. And it's, uh, it's very important to, to think every time the text gets entered somewhere in the site, to which level of flexibility um, are you going to allow that text to be a kind of entered in? Right? And we'll talk a, a bit more about this in the example. Again, some, some useful modules there. And we need to keep this in mind. And it's, it's, it's a tension. So on the one hand, you have the, the content strategist that needs to be able to do absolutely everything, right? So we break everything down into uh, discrete pieces of information that we can manipulate in wonderful ways. Um, and then you have the content creators that go into you know, node slash add, and it's, oh my god, there's like 50 fields here. There is no easy answer. Um, there's lots of things that one can do, thinking of the user experience, um, hiding things, automating things, but ultimately it's just finding that right balance. Okay, so that's kind of in terms of building your content types and defining you know, what pieces make up your world. Uh, another thing that's quite interesting to, to spend time thinking about is what are the different ways you can categorize content. And obviously, vocabularies and taxonomies are one of them, but there's actually quite a few variations within that. And it begins even before vocabularies. You know, you can have stuff like um, um, just simple lists, and they have their benefits at time. It's limited choice. It can't be changed uh, easily. Um, but it ensures consistency, and for a few limited cases, it makes a lot of sense. So kind of step through those options and always do um, advantages, disadvantages discussion to figure out you know, what makes sense. So you can go from lists to tags, and this is using vocabularies, and this will be you know, open-ended. And uh, this is great because it's very simple, but it does mean you can end up with thousands and thousands of tags and you need some strategy in terms of how you're going to manage all this. 
And again, we'll talk a bit more about this. Then you have fixed vocabularies that are great. They give you fine-grained control. Um, you can also introduce fields to taxonomy terms, and that's uh, extremely useful. But then you also have other things. You know, categorization is not just about vocabularies. You can use flags to allow content editors, users, whoever, to build lists of things. Maybe that's what makes sense. So kind of think, uh, you know, think of the options. Even organic groups, um, in a way, is a way to categorize content because you can group content based on a certain set of permissions they should have. Organic groups let, let you define what users can create within a group. Uh, you can group it for community to say this is the content that this group of people did. Um, so it's, it's yet another tool to model the world in Drupal. And I think maybe of, of all the kind of different tools, the tools for taxonomy are really important, especially for large sites. You know, you want to periodically, if you have tags, clean things up. So something like taxonomy merge that just lets you bunch things together uh, is very useful. Um, taxonomy tools provides a whole series of useful things. Uh, we'll check that out. And don't forget, it's not just about people. Feed the machines. That's, that's how I got into content strategy. It's thinking about how can I break the content up so that I can annotate it, annotate it and feed it to the machines. And again, Drupal is, is great for this. So you have RDFA kind of in core. There is um, uh, support for Facebook graph, for schema.org and so on. OK, that said, modeling Italy. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. So that's fine. We have all these tools to, to model the world. Uh, what are we going to do about it? Uh, and how are we going to use it? So I just wanted to step through a practical example and just show you, you know, how we went about um, implementing content strategy in, uh, uh, for Italy. Now, the first thing we did was actually, you know, because this is a site that had years and years of content, we did a content audit, trying to figure out what are the things that work, what are the things that don't work. And it's slow, and it's boring, and it's painful, but it's extremely useful, right? Because um, it gives you a sense of where you are now. How much do you have? What, what makes sense? What can you throw away? And so on. So after our audit, we spent a lot of time talking about, you know, what do we want to achieve as Italy? Uh, what do our users want to achieve? Uh, building user profiles. And I'm not going to go into the detail of that. This is kind of for Drupal site building rather than content strategy. But these this exercises are extremely useful because they, uh, obviously, they give you the definition of what you need, right? So, so once you do all of this and you have a sense of where you are and where you want to go, you can start thinking, okay, how do I need to model my content in order to get me where I needed to be? Uh, and you start doing content models. This is literally kind of one of the early drafts of the, uh, of the content model for Italy magazine. And I will spare you the details. It was very exciting. Kind of the, the, the main issue is uh, thinking of content both in terms of uh, content categories or as someone I heard yesterday said, you know, types of types. So you have, in it on Italy Magazine, we have stuff like editorial. Those are stories that uh, journalists write. We have resources. These are things that are, in a way, much more evergreen, recipes, uh, language lessons, and so on. We have listings that actually advertisers generate. And then we have things that the community generates. Right? So this gives us a way to group the different types of types uh, and treat it in different ways. And then think of you know, how the, uh, the, um, uh, the navigation is going to, to reflect that. 
Something that was extremely important for Italy is, you know, the, the, the objective is to model Italy. Now, Italy has, um, uh, model Italy for people who are interested to go to Italy for holidays and kind of enjoy Italy. Uh, if we're going to model Italy, let's say from the political perspective, I would quit. Um, so yeah, from the lifestyle perspective, it's awesome. So uh, you have things like culture and um, food and drink and art, and everything is essentially based on two main axes. One is location, you know, where is the thing you're talking about? And the other one is the big cross-section. Is this about culture? Is this about art? Is this about food and drink? Then you have subtopics. So it could be things like, um, um, I don't know, sports or fashion or property and so on. Um, and then you have tags, and tags are open-ended. And one of the things we needed to do with tags is sit down with the content creators and discuss what are the rules in terms of how tags get created. And no, when do you create tags? Because we'd have all sorts of weird things. Um, and essentially, in the end, we got down to something like, you know, it's people, it's events, uh, it's kind of big uh, items like that. So once you have your different um, content types, and you have your vocabularies that tie all these things together, you dive into building the, you know, sketching out the details of this. And one of the more interesting ones is recipes, because recipes, and it's kind of the content strategy example, because it's both complicated and easy to explain. Uh, because everyone knows that recipes has a list of ingredients, and it has a time and a difficulty. Um, and what's, what's interesting, here is thinking of the structure of your content type in a way that's going to open up possibilities for you. So for example, what I have there is um, a field collection to enter the ingredient and the quantity, right? And this is uh, an open-ended vocabulary, so it's essentially tags, but just for recipes. So every time a new ingredient gets added to the system, we have a page that says, you know, are you interested in cooking something with prosciutto or mozzarella or whatever? You can go to that page and see all the recipes that have that. From the content creator's perspective, it's relatively simple, you know. Uh, the main rule there is please try not to duplicate ingredients and there are tools and ways to make sure that that doesn't happen. And you, you both get a breakdown of um, your content into all sorts of different categories, and you also have a way to, um, to enter that. And finally, the other thing is, because we're kind of pulling different things together, you can see one recipe and see the related recipes and um, see things like cooking schools, because all that falls under our food and drink um, cross-section. There is there's kind of an interesting cutoff point between your creating content types for content creators that belong to your organization, so you can get mean with them and say, "Why didn't you do that? I told you not to type just anything in there. You know, go fix it." And users that you actually have to be nice to. It's annoying. Um, but, uh, you know, we didn't want to miss the chance on Italy Magazine to not be able to categorize our content that gets generated by users. So the approach, and we're still developing exactly, uh, you know, what's the best balance, is to A, make it very simple. So they just have, like, you know, a simple text box. They can um, enter the question. They can just drag and drop images. But then on the kind of the next page, we say, you know, please you know, help us out here. You're part of this community. If you actually add a topic and you add a location, it's going to be so much better for everyone because other people are going to be able to find your question and answer it and you're helping everyone out. And that was extremely useful and it's surprising. Uh, I think it's something like 90% of questions 
have topics and locations added to them. I was, I was literally expecting you know, everyone to be jumping that page, but you ask nicely and people respond. I don't know. So you do all that, you do all that setup, and then you can just sit back and enjoy the returns. And that's kind of the, um, this is when you start seeing that content strategy is working for you. you um, there's a lot of upfront discussions, a lot of debate. You know, how are we supposed to model our world? How granular do we, do we need to make it and so on? But once you've done all that and you've implemented it, then you can kind of um, enjoy the results. And, you know, some of the things that we, we do on Italy Magazine is uh, we generate streams of content dynamically uh, based on rules because we have so many different ways of saying, you know, go get me something from property that is in this section of Italy, go maybe find a related recipe, go find something from community and kind of put it all together. And on Italy Magazine we use NoteQ to kind of put the streams together and they can be updated both uh, manually, so an editor can go in and say, you know, it's very important that we have a specific story in a specific uh, position, but they can also be updated uh, automatically. So you can uh, kind of look at how your statistics are doing and just go grab that content and put it in the right position. We can uh, because we have all this um, division and tagging and so on, we can have an archive and we have content essentially from 99, uh, but really from, let's say from 2005, it's much more structured. So that's nine years of content. There is a lot going on there. And we, we use Solar in the back end to power all our searches. And because there's such good integration between Drupal and Solar, we can build up all sorts of different archives um, of, uh, you know, of our content, and people love it. They use it a lot. We can do things like you know, just the recipes. We've uh, we spent the time to set up the, the content type for recipes, to do all, that, uh, all those fields and create the tags for the, re for the ingredients and so on. And now you can say, you know, okay, I want sweets, I want uh, primi, secondi, and so on. We do location pages. Um, Italy has 8,300 kind of different locations, and those are just like the official ones. And Italy Magazine has a page for each one of those. Um, and we pull together content from across the site building essentially this mini sites where you know you go to Sicily and you can see Sicilian recipes and properties and experiences and it's no effort because the content strategy uh, up front led us in this direction. So this, this are kind of the things that are um, extremely useful and why it makes sense to spend a lot of time to think about what you need up front think about the ways you're going to describe it. And let's say Sicily is actually a taxonomy term page, right? So it's, uh, um, it, it's just that cross section. And we attached uh, fields to the taxonomy term because it's an entity and that works the same like everything else. And then we went to Wikipedia uh, with that term and said, okay, give me all the information like longitude, latitude, and so on, and that's the, the map and info uh, page there. I forgot to put a screenshot in. Um, and that kind of you know, brings that cross-section of information together. Then we let, with flags, as I said, it's another way to categorize things, we let our users create lists of stuff they like. And uh, for the time being, it's, uh, you know, I'm thinking of buying that. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you can kind of have your users generate lists and then you can group all that together. So you can do things like most favorite properties in Tuscany and you know, all of that stuff. Um, 
And of course, you can feed the machines. Um, so right now we're working on um, a mobile app for the property section. And it's, it's kind of absurd how simple it is. Uh, we're using um, uh, titanium accelerator and we're just providing uh, you know, JSON from the, the Drupal site, putting that together. It's, uh, there, was, there was a presentation before um, about kind of, uh, building products in Drupal and, and startups. And it's Christoph, if anyone knows Christoph. And something that Christoph said struck me. He said, it's amazing you know, the amount of work and technology that goes into us being in this room watching this. And it's, it's very much like that. You know, we, we take certain things for granted, but it's an extremely staggering level of complexity uh, that comes together and lets us just do these things very simply as long as we take the time to think of the model of our world, right, our domain. So everything else is taking care of us. The tools are there. It's all there. We just need to spend the time to think of how we're going to model our world. Okay, so I'm just going to talk briefly about producing and sharing content. Um, and the first thing I'm going to do, which is a great shortcut, is tell you that um, there's a great presentation Adrian did, which is our technical director, on you know, showing the authors some love. Best session title ever, right? Um, and this is just all the things you can do to make it easier for content creators. Um, well, maybe not all the things, a lot of things. Uh, you can do to uh, make it easier for content creators to create content. Now, as I mentioned at the start, content strategy is you know, thinking about the organizational goals, thinking about the user goals, thinking about the content you need to satisfy those goals. It's also thinking about how you're going to send that content out into the world. And it's also thinking about uh, you know, what, what is that process? What is that workflow? And the one thing I'm going to say about workflow is the less of it you need, the better. And challenge, challenge your organizations about exactly why it has to go through uh, five different people that have to tick some box that are so busy that they're not actually going to read it. And just think about how you can simplify your um, uh, your workflow. And there's, I'm, I can't believe I'm going to do this, but I'm going to plug WordPress right here. So that I, this was from years ago, I watched this interview where you had Dries and Matt, right? And they were talking about WordPress and Drupal. And uh, I agree, you know, Drupal all the way, right? But there was one thing Matt said, which was actually uh, quite interesting. So they were asking about you know, using content in large organizations, and Dries was obviously saying, Drupal is fantastic, we have, you, know, you can have any workflow you need. Um, what Matt said is, when we go into organizations, when we go into newspapers and they talk to us about workflow, what we say is, why do you need that workflow? And I think that makes sense. And it may be that you actually do need that workflow, but think about it. You know, ask that question. Don't just go ahead and implement a very complex uh, state diagram that kind of does that. Then the other thing to do is study user behavior. Um, and this is, <laughs> if you're working, how many are kind of creating content for in sort of a media setting like newspaper, magazine, and so on? Okay, so you, you, you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, I think if you're, if you're doing it internally in the organization, it's slightly simpler. Uh, but if you're doing it for users out there, it's so much fun. Um, because you have to think of everything, right? You have to think, how am I going to write this thing on Twitter 
so that it gets the right response. And you know, we're all inundated nowadays with stuff from BuzzFeed and uh, Appify or whatever that's called, which is uh, most amazing thing ever. You won't believe what happened next. And that's all, you know, it works for them. Uh, that's studying user behavior and kind of figuring out what people are going to respond to. Unfortunately, those things are, you know, lowest common denominator. Um, but it's, uh, and you don't need to do it that way, but that's very important. You have to think of, you know, when are your users online so that you actually tell them the thing you want to tell them. Prepare an editorial calendar. Um, it's, it's kind of a shame that Drupal right now doesn't have an editorial calendar solution, and that's something that hopefully we will um, be working on. We are kind of thinking of how to structure that. But having an editorial calendar, having something that says these things are going to be published on this date, these people are responsible, this is how it's going to go out on social media and so on, is extremely important. Uh, on Italy, we're only you know, like pushing out maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 pieces of content a day, of which seven are significant, or maybe six. Um, being able to manage that is a task. If you go to larger uh, media outlets, they're doing 50, 60, 100 pieces of content a day. Right? Putting all that into a calendar is extremely important. Uh, as you're doing that with Drupal, kind of from the technical side, you have to think of how that's going to impact um, you know, the way you, you publish things. So it may be that uh, you, know, you have some caching in place that uh, means that even though the, the content editor hit save, that thing is not actually visible. Or they changed it and they thought you know, they had fixed the problem, maybe they had the wrong title, uh, but caching didn't um, fix that. And, and it's actually pretty simple to, to fix these issues. You just have to make sure you think about it. Um, and same thing with sharing tools. Um, they can be very annoying, although they're very useful. So, you know, stuff like Facebook likes and tweets and Pinterest and Instagram and... Uh, I hate all this stuff, by the way. <laughs> but it's, it's extremely important and useful. Measure everything. I, um, so I, I love Monty Python, and uh, whenever I talk about, um, you know, why are we doing things, it is the Spanish Inquisition. And I, I wish I could bring some torture tools as well. Tell me why, tell me. Um, you know, you have to ask the right questions. Anecdotal information is great, but that's all it is. Um, use graphs. And we, the, the way we integrate a lot of um, additional information on, on, on Italy, and so just to give you one example, um, we do quizzes, right? This is something that our users love. Um, so this quiz is uh, figuring out what pizza it is, right? So you see an image. What pizza is that? Margarita. Well done. Um, and what we did, and it was actually very painless, is we integrated uh, event tracking with Google Analytics. So we literally know how many times people clicked on the various pizzas, you know, and how many got it right and how many got it wrong. And this, uh, because you know, this is all kind of a, a JavaScript thing, so there's no page reloads and stuff like that, but it gives you two things. You can actually go back to whoever is controlling the budget for content creation and say, look, this is the engagement for my quiz. I built it in a way that you don't have page loads uh, because that's better for users, but I can still show you that there is engagement. There is value in this. And I'm not doing it just because someone said, oh, this is a great thing. I'm going back to you with numbers. Right? and proving that it's a great thing. So as you're building everything together, make sure you think of what are the things that you're going to measure. Now, I'm just going to close by saying that 
um, you know, content strategy is not uh, kind of all there is to it. Um, and this is something that uh, um, Rick Sissel, that's over there, is, is working on, which is uh, kind of engagement strategy, kind of taking it one step higher and saying what are the, the things that are um, tie everything together, you know, as we go out and talk to users, what are the channels we talk to them through, what are the actions on the side that lead to goals being achieved and so on. So um, you kind of, you need to place your, your content strategy within maybe a slightly higher level uh, perspective of, you know, overall engagement. So not just creating content, but how you, you engage people with that content and where you engage with them with that content and so on. Okay, I think we're also almost up with time. One more time. Thank you very much. Any questions? You need that module list. The, the question was where can I get that module list? I'll, I'll have the slides up as quickly as possible. Not today, because we're having like a huge barbecue contest later. Um, so maybe not even tomorrow, but as quickly as possible. Okay, cool, I think that's it. Thank you, everyone.